Thank you. Almost there. Almost there. Uh, we need to solve. Okay. Um, <laughs> Do you see my password on the stage? No. No. Oh. Great. <laughs> okay, you don't spoil my surprise. Uh, so, uh, today I'm going to tell you more um, of a background information uh, about um, image optimization. Not just here's a tool, here's a manual, you use this and this, and this option, but more like understanding why do you have to do it, um, how does it work, what it is for in general, so you can know how to choose a tool and know uh, how to use all of them in general. But before we begin, first, I have to show you something very, very important. Um, yeah. So, look at this ball of fluff. <laughs> Isn't this great? Uh, this is a dog. It's, um, it's, um, It's a Samoyed, Samoyedskaya Savaka. <laughs> They're absolutely wonderful. Uh, would you like to see 10 more of them? Like, uh, but may maybe not if they're lolling like that. It's, it's tiring. So you could see them if it worked so quickly and effortlessly like this. So uh, you can just view 10 of them, no problem. They're quick, instant. That's what we're aiming for with image optimization. Um, if you want to keep your users engaged, uh, if you have customers and you want to sell them your stuff, you want your website to be super, super snappy. So they don't feel like it's work. They feel like they're in control, and it's just going to take a second, and they'll be done. On the other hand, if the website is loading, 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 people automatically think, oh, hmm. Maybe I'll do it later, and they don't. So you lose them. And um, in a recent couple of years, uh, making a fast, snappy website has actually gotten more difficult. Because the machines we use um, for the browsing, like the, you know, people in general, have changed. They've changed from something like this to something like this and then to this. It's hard to believe, but Android is number one most popular operating system in the world. And majority of the browsing is done these days on mobile devices. And uh, these aren't your fast iPhones. Uh, these are mostly Android devices. And the fastest Android device, even top of the line, is Got me. Um, even top of the line device is half of the speed of an iPhone, and most of them are much slower. And to make it worse of all, uh, browsing is done using mobile networks. In theory, we're supposed to have all those super fast 4G, soon 5G network connections, and they say it's like 50 megabits, 100 megabits, whatnot, but they're like up to this speed. Uh, with a little star, that means it's a lie. You're not getting this. Uh, in practice, uh, if you're outside of a big city, or if it's raining, or if you're in a building, or if anything goes wrong, uh, you get weaker signal, or your phone will connect using older technology, and you will get slower speed. And this difference between the best case where you have like the latest phone and you're straight ahead close to an antenna um, to the next best, best thing might be dramatic. Like there's a 10 times difference almost between different uh, generations of mobile uh, wireless technology. Um, so if everything goes wrong, it's actually nice, not a big problem. But if anything is less than perfect, oh, that's pretty bad. So we were dealing with almost two different uh, groups of users. 
the ones on the best case, like somebody on a desktop, fiber network connection, which is like you sitting in your office and designing your websites. And then everyone else who has to deal with overcrowded mobile networks um, and poor signal, and um, maybe they're on a train, or uh, they don't live in a huge city. Or they might even have a decent phone, but then pay a lot for the uh, bandwidth, so they don't want to uh, download a lot of data, even if they could. So let's start with the easy case, the fast connections. So for fast connections, everything you have to do is don't ruin it with JavaScript. That's all you have to do. You see, the best, the fastest, most reliable uh, way to load an image is the good old image tag. You cannot beat it. You see, uh, the way the browser processes documents, pages in general, is first it loads HTML, then it lo starts loading images, scans the whole document for all the images and starts loading them, and then starts running JavaScript. So no matter what you do, how clever you are, you might have the latest, greatest React, Vue, whatever framework, it's not going to help. Like, JavaScript can do a lot of things, but it cannot go back in time. So you have to use image. There are lots of ways to make images slower, lots of ways to make them not load, but to load, you have to use image tag. Uh, and I'm, it's, it's, really, it's really great. You get native, uh, off the main thread, optimized preloading. You get HTTP2 network prioritization across all the requests from the browser. You get progressive rendering. It means the user starts seeing some of the image uh, only after loading 15% of the data. So it's like you're saving almost all of the data on the image to get the first render. It's asynchronously decoded with no junk off the main thread. You don't need a special JavaScript API, any special calls for this. It's responsive in all browsers that handle uh, all kinds of weird screens and responsive. So you're basically having 100% browser support. You've seen yesterday, Netscape 2.0, Space Jam works perfect. Uh, and it's like zero kilobytes, just zipped, compressed, built in. And I know it might, might feel weird. You you're, will go back to your company uh, from the conference, and colleagues will ask, so what have you learned about images? Show us the cool technology. And you'll be like, yeah, image tag. <laughs> <laughs> so just so you have something to put in your notes, there's a little bit more you can do uh, with your image tags. Well, first of, all, first of all, there's a special case if you're using media queries that change aspect ratio of images or change content of the images depending on um, the layout of the page, uh, the viewport or whatever, then you can use picture element to supply multiple images that fit each one fits different media query. But most of the time, you will just have one hero image that uh, spans the entire width of something. That can be done simply uh, by listing all the sizes you need in the sizes attribute. And the most basic case, where you just want images to be nice and crisp on the fancy, shiny retina displays. Uh, it's the source set, which you use to put high resolution uh, version of the image in. So yeah, that's the good case. No problem. Uh, the hard case, the, the one where you really, really need image optimization. It's those mobile connections, uh, slower devices. Uh, of course, you want to have uh, rich media, uh, image-heavy websites. So how do you squeeze all of that? You might be wondering, wait a minute, why do I have to optimize it? I already maybe save for web, have some kind of a fancy export function. Uh, why is it not optimized already? Uh, to understand why is it not, we have to go back in time to 1999. That was the year when Photoshop save for web was released. It's so old, and it basically hasn't been upgraded since. So the Safer Web in Photoshop was designed for computers with screens like this, with those huge blurry pixels and wobbly picture. 
uh, and it's been tuned for those. Like JPEG itself, the default settings in JPEG have been tuned for this. And back then, Photoshop required 16 megabytes of RAM. That's not gigabytes, that's 1,000 times smaller, 1,000 times uh, less powerful computers. So it just, the safer web and the tools we have, and it's not just Photoshop, it's also Image Magic uh, and everything else that uses libjpeg, um, most common library for saving JPEGs, uh, it's from that era. It's, they are designed for the world that does not exist anymore. And these days we can do better. We can optimize our images uh, by using extra processing power we have in our computers, by taking advantage of the new research that has been done since then and new knowledge. So I'm going to explain you image optimization using analogy. Imagine you have to pack for a trip, and you have three seconds to pack. What you're going to do? You're going to take all your stuff from all around your apartment and just throw it in. Right, and in three seconds, you're packed. But it's everything there, and there's your cat inside, and all the stuff you don't need. And when you tell Photoshop to save an image, it behaves like that. The Photoshop is like, oh my, user wants to save an image. All the layers, everything goes inside. All the metadata goes inside, immediately saved, done. But it's a lot of stuff that you don't need. And here's where optimization comes in. It's going to spend extra time and extra effort to fold all the shirts, to compress all the pixels, to remove uh, unnecessary metadata, um, to make everything, everything packed neatly and tightly uh, in your file. So packing like that takes extra effort. That's why the tools for optimization sometimes they take much longer. Um, might even take a minute to save a file. This is because they're putting the extra effort to try all the combinations of all the settings, of all the possible options uh, in the file format to choose the best one for your specific image. Uh, and the same if you go to a trip with a nicely packed suitcase, maybe your mom spent the whole night uh, before the trip packing you uh, beautifully, and you unpack just to take one thing out, and when you have to leave, suddenly your stuff doesn't fit anymore. Like, you've, you've made a mess again. It's the same with images. If you optimize an image using a dedicated tool, but then you open that image back in the editor, change it, save it again, or resize it, it's going to be unoptimized again, because the new tool will save it again quickly, just throw everything in. Um, and there are two kinds of optimization. The lossless optimization is everything you've thrown in is kept. The program assumes you knew what you were doing, you really need your cat on your trip, uh, so it's going to pack your cat nicely, and it's going to keep, uh, you're maybe going for a weekend, but it's going to keep all the 14 sets of clothes that you've put in there. It doesn't lose anything. So it's a safe option, um, especially for images. You, you don't know what's going to happen to quality, so uh, you don't want your tool to ruin anything uh, by chance. But it's also less effective, because the tool cannot do much uh, with extra data that you don't need. And there's the other kind of optimization, lossy optimization. It loses some data. Uh, and the goal is to lose things you don't need. To keep it our analogy, it will just uh, leave the extra clothes you don't need at home. The cat's going to stay. Um, so you only pack what you need. And for images, this means if an image has several millions of pixels, there's no way you care about every single pixel. Your eyes just don't see that much information. Uh, so the lossy optimization uses optical illusions. It uses tricks, uh, knowing how your eyes work to remove the details that you wouldn't be able to see. Uh, and I've noticed when people save images in something like export option, um, they try to notice the trick of compression and get rid of it. But it's actually defeating the purpose. If you cannot see the compression artifacts, if you cannot see this, the distortions with your naked eye without the help of a zoom, that's good. It means it works. It means it tricked you properly. 
at the zoom level that you need. So when you're exporting images, when you're saving them, tune them for the exact screen and the exact zoom level, which is mostly one-to-one, -one, um, that you need. Don't try to look closely to break the illusion. Um, and that quality slider, when you're exporting uh, something like a JPEG, is your best friend to get good compression. Uh, if you have something like your favorite number that you always use for saving a JPEG that you feel like, oh yeah, that's a nice, good, safe quality, your files are probably twice as large than they need to be. Uh, the optimal quality for each file, and unfortunately, is different for every image. Uh, so some images tolerate uh, only a little bit compression, some images are fine with a lot of compression. And getting that slider even a little bit lower actually makes a huge difference. It's very intuitive. Humans are not really good at thinking in exponential functions, but the relationship between file size and quality is exponential. It means if you add only a little bit quality to the image, it increases the file size a lot. Or the other way, if you decrease only a little, sometimes so little that you don't even see the difference, it actually makes a visible difference for the compression. And that creates a trap that I've seen many people fall into. It's like, they start with an image that is compressed with some ridiculously high quality because somebody thought, you know, it's gonna be super hipster, extra, top notch, uh, my beautiful image, don't want to ruin it. Um, and you optimize it with some tool that just happens to lower the quality a little bit. Imagine you take JPEG saved at quality 95 and save it with quality 90. Who can tell the difference between JPEG at 95 and 90? Like, if anyone there, you're lying. You, you, you would have to have microscope and carefully analyze the image. But it will have difference 20% on the file size. So we're like, wow, I cannot see the difference, but it's 20% smaller. But then you can take the same image and save it at 85. It will look almost the same as image at 80, and it will be still 20% smaller. And then you can take it, <laughs> you see where I'm going, and then uh, you can save it again. And every time you resave it, resave it, you will notice the difference in file size because it's obviously easy to compare numbers, it will be smaller, and it will look almost the same. So it's not some magic, it's not fantastic optimization tool, it's just how maths work. That's math, that's just JPEG, it's built in. Uh, so don't fall for that trick. If your image looks good at the quality 75, just save it at quality 75. So that multiple saving, it's not a trick. It's not, not a technique that you should be using. It's the opposite. It's the absolute nonsense that just ruins images. If you save image once at the lowest quality, that is fine. Uh, it's good. And uh, saving once will give you the best ratio of quality to file size. Uh, this trap is especially uh, hard if you're trying to compare several tools and you'll optimize in one tool and, oh yeah, it made files smaller, but then you optimize in another tool and it made files smaller still. And then you put it in a third, file, third uh, tool and that wins again. Every tool will win every time because they do this trick. They just lower the quality a little bit to give you a smaller file size. So. Uh, because your eyes cannot see the almost the same difference, uh, there is a tool called the DSSIM, it's shortcut for a structural R similarity, that can judge quality of an image exactly, precisely. So if you're trying to, somebody tells you, hey, use this new tool, it's the new great optimization service or something like that, um, you can optimize images, get them to be the same file size, and then compare score comparing to the original, which one actually has more of the quality. Or you can tweak quality in different tools to have the same uh, similarity score, uh, and then see which file size is actually better to get this ratio. So, you know, um, although it's hard to see every step, like, you know, we save it from 85 to 80, uh, you don't see it with your eyes, but of course it matters. Like, uh, by the law of induction, you. If it didn't matter, then saving JPEG at 90 would look the same as saving at zero, but, but it doesn't. 
there is a difference. Um, so that's the theory uh, in practice. I've collected the best tools that I could find, uh, and I put them in an app called Image Optim. And it works like this. You take all your files, drag and drop them into Image Optim, and you're done. Well, it, it, you might need to wait a minute or so. If you have a MacBook Air, I'm sorry, it's going to take uh, some time. But uh, it will do its best to make your images compressed as it should. And there's like a super trick in Image Optim, hidden option for you. Uh, not many people know, but it's by default lossless. So by default, it doesn't do anything uh, dramatic with images. But if you allow it, if you go to the Tools menu and allow lossy minification, uh, it will also adjust quality for you. Uh, and it will use more advanced options. And this will give you huge savings. So if you knew Image Optim before, but you haven't uh, known this option, that's now your secret ninja uh, option to squeeze <laughs> uh, extra uh, data from it. There's one uh, image format uh, that cannot be fixed with optimization. It's GIF. Uh, if you have a GIF, I'm sorry, it's hopeless. You have to convert it to a video if it moves. If it doesn't move, convert it to PNG. PNG 8, specifically. Actually, if you have a PNG that is not PNG 8, um, convert it to PNG 8 as well. PNG 8 is one of the modes in, in PNG that happens to be the, the most efficient one. Uh, it's sort of supported by some programs, but uh, they might uh, make those files look bad and grainy like Sega kind of a game. Um, but there is one that I've worked really, really hard on, uh, hard on uh, to uh, optimize PNGs really well with super quality that most of the time you don't notice any loss, but it is a sort of a lossy compressor uh, for PNGs. It still keeps sharp edges, it still keeps transparency, but it might make your PNG four times smaller. So, you know, all your big files that you want some transparency on, all the screenshots, um, if you uh, process them with PNG quant, uh, they'll suddenly be four times smaller. Uh, and if you've seen um, some um, web, web services uh, and other tools that do something magical with PNGs, yep, all of them are using PNG quant. Like, <laughs> that's, a, that's a small monopoly uh, in optimization tools uh, for PNGs. Uh, for JPEG, uh, I can recommend you Moz JPEG. That's Mozilla's uh, improved JPEG encoder. It's based on uh, a fork of the original libjpeg from 1998, so kind of old. But it's been uh, upgraded in 2014 for the modern screens, high resolutions, powerful computers. Unfortunately, the JPEG format is so flexible and has uh, some nice built-in configurability uh, that most JPEG was able to improve compression in JPEG without losing compatibility. Uh, with uh, anything else. So most JPEG uh, files work in all browsers, no problem. So you can just use it. Um, most JPEG itself is a library, uh, so not so easy to use. But fortunately, people have packaged it as uh, NPM packages, for example. So we can integrate it with your Gulp work workflow if you want. Um, I've built it uh, into uh, Image Optim uh, for Mac. If you don't have a Mac, I have a little online uh, interface that looks kind of ugly. I'm very sorry about it. But in terms of technology behind it, uh, that's the nicest thing I could develop. Uh, so to sum it up, um, the web is now mobile. Uh, slow networks are becoming more popular. Uh, new users on the web uh, are starting with small uh, devices with high resolution screens and slow CPUs and slow everything, which is difficult. So you have to think about them. Um, if you want to load images quickly, use regular image tag in HTML sent by the server. Uh, and uh, 
it's fashionable to have some kind of a loader, a uh, light box or gallery thing where uh, images fade in nicely. It looks nice when you demonstrate it to somebody, but in actual use, it's annoying. And especially if you optimize your images and they happen to load in one tenth of a second and you add a fade in that takes a whole second, like why did you just make it 10 times slower for no reason? Uh, quality setting is the best bet, and your eyes are still the best tool. Uh, so if you have a time uh, to export your images one by one and adjust quality, uh, like something like a huge hero image when it actually makes a difference, do that, please. Uh, if not, uh, try to automate it. Uh, there are web services, um, Cloudinary, for example, that does it pretty well. Uh, ImageOptim has a service that does it pretty well. That can help you with, if you have a CMS with millions of images that you couldn't uh, manually look at everyone. If you're optimizing, optimize it as a last step uh, before shipping the file to the user. Uh, you cannot optimize and then edit. You cannot optimize and then resize. You have to do everything else before optimizing. And uh, there are lots of tools that you could use, but uh, you can focus on just PNG quant for all your PNGs, most JPEG for all your JPEGs, and forget about GIFs. Um, we do have a few minutes, so that's the first, that's the first end of my talk. Uh, if, you have a, if you have some questions, think of them now. Uh, and the first question I usually get, so I'm just gonna start with that, is, but what about WebP? Uh, so um, WebP is Google's format built into Chrome and uh, browser based on Chrome. Um, if you want it, so for a start, if you're, for example, a customer of Cloudflare, there's a checkbox, enable it, you'll get WebP if you want. Um, but the problem with, with WebP is it's not as great as it seems. We like new and shiny stuff, and this is, well, not really new anymore, but it's shiny. Uh, but people fall for, for a trap where they think WebP works so great. Uh, but if you see savings from WebP larger than maybe 20%, like if your file suddenly becomes five times smaller, you're falling for a trap of WebP having different scale of quality. Like uh, When you use the lowest quality in WebP, it's going to look nice because it does, doesn't go to a horrible, horrible mess that JPEG allows. Uh, if you go to a higher quality in WebP, the file will be still small because WebP actually cannot go very high with quality. It has some limitations in uh, precision of color and resolution of color um, that make, make it often look worse than uh, JPEG, even if you save both at the quality 99. And uh, I'm torn about WebP because it is better than JPEG. But uh, of the modern codecs that are used in the browsers, it's actually the worst. It's based on a VP8 codec from 2006 uh, that has, for video, been completely obsoleted, uh, even by uh, the same family of technologies, VP9, that is now used by YouTube and uh, a lot of services. And it's even slightly worse than the older codec from 2003. And uh, these days, we have all the browsers um, getting behind AV1, which is like VP10 or VP11 uh, generation of codecs. So, um, so WebP in some way in immortalized one of the oldest codecs. So it is better than uh, JPEG. Uh, if you look at the improvement in file size, it's something like this. Uh, the old JPEG, yeah, bad. Most JPEG improved it by a chunk, and WebP still improved it by a chunk. But then VP9 improved it even more, and then uh, H.265 and AV1 improved it even more. So if you care about that difference and think it's okay to change to a non-standard format for this amount of saving, well, why not this saving, and why not this saving? Why not go all the way and have half size of the WebP? So there's a BPG format. Uh, it's not natively supported by any browser, uh, but there's a JavaScript polyfill. It uses the same technology that iPhones use for storing your photos internally uh, in the latest OS, where they, you suddenly get double your storage. 
Uh, it's one of the best compression that we can have. So if you're really, really desperate for the best compression, no matter how problematic it is from the compatibility perspective, then there's uh, BPG format. And there's one more funny thing. Given that we have those video codecs that have modern, uh, very efficient compression, we can do a trick and encode our images as a single frame of video. <laughs> it's, it's a horrible, horrible hack, but you can throw your image, give it to something like FFmpeg, and it will make a one second video of your image and embed it as a video, make browser play it, <laughs> and it's going to be uh, smaller than a static image. If your website has this fancy animated uh, background, don't feel bad about this. If you encode it well with a proper settings, it might be smaller than a regular image and smaller than WebP. Uh, and Safari even supports uh, videos in the image tag now. And if all other browsers follow, I don't know, we might have this <laughs> really silly situation where we use videos for images because we have better videos, video codecs than we have image codecs. Um, so this is the trick. Thank you very much. Colonel, I'm right here, so why don't you join me? Uh, wow, that is interesting. The last slide was It's really a hack. <laughs> I like hacks. Who doesn't like a good hack, I think? So that's interesting. So I have a question for you. What about WebP? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have other formats as well. So we have G JPEG XR and others. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering at this point, just in general, so why is it that image formats seem to have such a horrible, difficult time to get adopted. Mm. While so everything else, the technology in terms of grid layout and stuff, it's getting out quite quickly out of the door, mm. but not images. Image formats are for sharing images. You share your image from your server with everyone in the world. Uh, so the value in the formats are in value reaching your users. Uh, if you have super cool new format, but nobody can see it, then your format has no value for you. Uh, and getting everyone to upgrade their devices, getting all the tools, uh, all the viewers, uh, every website where you upload your avatar or whatever, it just t upgrading the whole world at the same time is so, so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, also, JPEG is not so bad. Um, the, I've heard a quote about it that it's an alien technology from the future. Uh, it's been developed more than 30 years now. Uh, and it's still holding strong. Um, we're still getting new scientific papers where people uh, compare their fancy neural network-based compression algorithms that run on 150 super powerful servers, and they're 20% better than JPEG. What? So much progress, so much technology to beat JPEG only by a small margin. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think JPEG nailed it. So it's stuck in being good enough that it's not that much of a pain. Uh, and the new technology has to be 10 times more, 10 times better for everyone to really, really appreciate it and take the pain and effort of upgrading. Interesting. Um, now, we also have no responsive images. We have image set for background images. Um, we still use, or many of us, I guess, use tools like, again, like Optimizer, but also Cloudinary that would serve image in the right format, in the right um, size. Uh, what about client hints? Are we getting somewhere with client hints? Can they help us in terms of with images altogether to reduce the amount of work we need to write uh, markup for responsive images and source certain sizes? Mm -hmm. um, or maybe you should also explain what client hints are. Uh, uh, so client hints are HTTP headers uh, com uh, that communicate on the network level to your server what kind of a screen do you have. Uh, so it's designed specifically for those web services that claim to automatically optimize all your images without yes. you touching your markup. Uh, so it's a convenience feature. Uh, they're almost, almost the same like source set. So uh, yeah, if you're using them, that's fine. Uh, but uh, source set is a little bit more powerful because uh, it allows the browser uh, to change the quality when it wishes, mm -hmm. to choose the quality dynamically, to re when you resize, for example, right? Uh, when you resize your window, that's the sizes attribute, yes, uh, which 
plant hints cannot do because they would have to go to the server uh, the every funnels. time you resize your window, yeah. which doesn't make sense. Um, so source is inflexible. And Chrome added a really cool feature uh, recently that if you have very slow connection, it will use lower resolution of images. It will take your source set and pick one uh, X image instead of the actual one that it needs, assuming it's going to be smaller image and load faster. And when the network is the bottleneck, that's the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, talking about hacks, by the way, there is this famous hack that I guess is horribly should not be advertised anywhere. But I'm going to mention it anyway. The compressive images hack. Oh, it's compressive images is not too bad. Um, we should also probably explain how that works. It's okay. okay. Uh, so oh. the, the idea idea between compressive images is uh, when you have high resolution screen, um, you can compress your image to a lower quality. This is because when pixels are smaller, the distortions from the com compression are, are also smaller. When pixels are more difficult to see, uh, the compression artifacts are more difficult to see, which means you can actually get away with lower quality. And, uh, and so, for example, you would take an image that's like... This is not a hack like anymore. It's a feature. Uh, so most JPEG libraries... But library it's misusing, abusing the resources and the memory. Um, so on if you, so on the devices that the don't have high resolution screen, it's some of a waste. Um, but more and more devices have uh, high resolution screens. So it's becoming less of a terrible waste. Yeah, because what you would need to do is you have an image which is 300 times 300, for example. You blow it up. You mm -hmm. save it with the worst possible quality yeah. and serve it in the smaller size. Yes. But the then if somebody chooses to save that image. Mm -hmm. The principle still holds, uh, even if you do it properly and serve 1x image uh, at a normal quality, and then have a 2x version at a lower quality. Uh, I've even built an option on the online uh, version of Image Optim. There's a check checkbox that will adjust all the parameters of JPEG for that kind of a compressive image mm -hmm. for retina displays when it knows what the size of the pixel is going to be. OK. Um, there was also talking again about the compression and pixels. And I think you mentioned neural networks as well. Um, you probably have heard about Let's Enhance I.O. Mm -hmm. Where the idea is to you take an image, if you have it in, say, in, a bed, in a small size, and you need to bloat it up, it kind of produces or tries to guess the pixels. It's brilliant. Um, it's probably going to be the future. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, these technologies are experimental, and before anything ends up being in the browsers, it has to be old and proven. Yeah, so it's actually quite expensive, but if you go to letsenhance.io, you can upload an image which is 300 times 300, and it outputs you 4,000 times 4,000, mm -hmm. and it's actually really good. I was yeah. very surprised by the result. The details are made up. Yes, so th it's all so made up. It's not like it uh, you know, guesses pixels. It's uh, just there's a famous case of um, some of the fax machines uh, that had a clever compression like that, but they ended up changing numbers uh, in the things you faxed. Because like six and eight look almost the same, so why not replace it with the same thing? Uh, but <laughs> sometimes don't want that. Yeah. Uh, so those neural networks might be too clever for right. some kinds of images. And there is also this new encoder by Google, because Google, our Google's friends like you know, bread and cheese. So there is Gutsli. Have you played mm -hmm. with Gutsli? Uh, Gutsli is uh, like most JPEG, but for higher quality images. Um, for web, it's probably an overkill because it uh, tries to save JPEG with no noticeable distortions. Um, on the web, you probably would rather tolerate some distortion but get a much smaller file. But if you're, for example, building an archive of JPEGs that you want to just keep forever somewhere, uh, then uh, Gwetsli encoder is the best way to get uh, good files at good quality uh, saved properly. Okay. Do you have something fancy that you could announce that's coming up in Image Optim at some point soon? Or do you have anything that you're working on? In uh, I have, I have like things that I'm working on um, on the network level, but I cannot announce it yet. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, well, maybe but next uh, time. So the, the, the hint in general is please use progressive images they're going to get even better. OK, so no baseline images anymore? No baseline. Never. Progressive, progressive is the thing. So essentially, you would declare baseline images as dead and GIF. GIF is dead. Dead. That's a statement. <laughs>
<laughs> oh wow. Uh, with this in mind, that's a good uh, ending of your talk. Okay, thank you so much thank for you. being here. Thanks, well done.